Okay, good afternoon. I'm Ed Mast, and I've been around FreeBSD for a while, mainly uh, uh, since the early 2000s. I, I've been using FreeBSD, became a FreeBSD committer in 2005. More recently, I've been involved with the, the FreeBSD Foundation, and um, for maybe the, at the end of, of last year, I started taking a, a closer look at this crazy thing called reproducible builds. Um, and I'll also just point out that I am presenting from uh, FreeBSD Current on my laptop and uh, uh, did a package update uh, uh, or package upgrade yesterday. Um, so uh, there's some uh, dog fooding going on here. So uh, <laughs> I'm hoping. I'm hoping that I don't die. My, my, uh, my, I don't have a panic after six slides. Um, this is an older. Uh, it's an X220, so uh, it's the the graphics drivers on here are pretty stable. <clears throat> I just wanted to quickly get a, a feel for um, the experience of people in the room. So I have a couple of a couple of different questions. How many in here uh, commit to or contribute to a, a BSD source, the base uh, kernel, user land? Pretty good, a pretty good portion of the audience. How many um, maintain ports or package source, other um, collections of third-party software? And how many have contributed, contributed in general to open source? So pretty much everyone. How many of you have heard of reproducible builds before? Very, very good. And how many have worked directly on making software reproducible, so submitting a patch or uh, investigating issues or anything? So quite a, um, quite a good but minority uh, turnout. So what is reproducible builds? It's really simple. The idea is you can build some software twice and get the same output. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to describe this a, a little bit backwards, perhaps, um, and get into some more detail later on. But one clarification is it really is any binary artifact that we're going to build. So we have some sort of source code that's human readable, or hopefully human readable and, hope, and human, write, uh, human written. Um, and we're going to build either a binary, uh, an executable out of that, or a package, uh, so a TXZ file, um, or it could be a uh, document, a PDF file, or a ISO image for an installer. Um, any, any sort of binary artifact that's the output of a build system um, build process that we want to have reproducible. So we start with some, some source code written by a human. Um, some sort of opaque build process, Clang in this case, turns it into some sort of binary artifact. And if we start with that same source file again and build it again, potentially by a different user, maybe on a different host, at a different time, um, but the same architect, same CPU architecture. Um, so you're not, we're not talking about x86 versus ARM or anything um, like that. The same same target. We want the final result to be identical. And why do we care about this? There's two different reasons. Um, there's been a lot of discussion recently, uh, a lot of growing discussion on reproducible builds from a software integrity and software assurance. Uh, perspective, um, and this, this is sort of, it's, it's made it to um, mainstream newspapers and uh, it's been picked up in, in, in the press, but um, I wanted to talk about some practical reasons uh, first, just because even if you don't care about the, um, uh, the software assurance aspects of, of this, this idea, there are some very compelling concrete reasons that reproducible builds are very important even for, um, j just for, for other reasons. And so some of these, uh, if we're, if we're going to have some sort of a package build cluster and every package that we generate, every unique package we're going to archive and, and keep, if the build produces an identical output each time, we'll, save a, we'll require a lot less storage space to save each of those, those packages. So say we're, we're building packages every week. Um, if the builds are not reproducible, every week we're going to generate a huge set of, of packages. If the source isn't changing in a given week and the package produces the same output, we're not going to need uh, extra storage space. And that also translates through to if someone's mirroring this, if someone's downloading it and installing it as an end user, um, we're going to avoid transferring or storing change, data that isn't really changed. 
And then if, we're, if we have some sort of a technique for doing a binary update, so FreeBSD update is the way that FreeBSD systems update the base system typically, and that's a binary update mechanism. And reproducible builds allow us to have either, uh, to, to facilitate small, the smallest possible binary update um, if, if, the, the, uh, if the build produces the same output when the input doesn't change, um, it doesn't directly follow, but t we expect that the changes will be, um, will be relatively small for, um, for a small input change. Um, Colin, you have a, a question? Right, so Colin's explaining um, some uh, aspects of, um, of reproducible builds that um, uh, will be, be explained here a little bit uh, in the slides a little bit later on. Um, and there's also some other really interesting, uh, interesting and useful aspects of reproducible builds. So in the FreeBSD ports uh, ecosystem, we have this thing called an XP run. It's an experimental build of the package set, and it's typically run by the FreeBSD port manager team. So this, these are the, the folks who run the, the, the package infrastructure. Um, and it, it takes a patch from a developer um, to either the base system or to the, something in the ports tree and applies that patch to the, the base or ports and, and is a build run of, um, of the entire port set, so 26,000 ports. Um, with the patch applied. And if we, if we know that we're starting from a base case of a reproducible build environment, there's a lot of good things we can do uh, with, with that X, X run result that we couldn't do if we don't know that it's reproducible at the beginning. So for example, if we're changing a tool chain component, um, I've recently committed ELF tool chain to the FreeBSD base system to replace quite a few of the uh, GNU bin utils tools. So things like obj copy and nm and size and strings come from ELF tool chain now instead of bin utils. Um, and if we have a reproducible port, set of re re reproducible ports, we can run that X run and see which packages have changed as a result of uh, a tool chain change. And if we're not expecting if we're expecting the tool chain to work exactly as the old one did, we'd expect to see no reproducible packages changed. Um, in this specific case, the ELF tool chain tools don't actually, uh, there's some, some liberties that, uh, that the tools are, are able to take in choosing the way that they lay out ELF objects, and uh, the ELF tool chain tools take some, make some different choices versus the GNU tools. But if we're doing an update, say, of, of the ELF tool chain tools later on, we'll be able to have confidence that the, the changes um, either don't break any packages that we, um, we don't expect, or if packages do change, we'll be able to know which ones we, we want to investigate in, in further detail. It also allows us, if we're making a change in a header file in the base system, to determine which packages that, will, uh, which, which packages that affects and feeds through into. Um, so we can determine either that packages that we expected um, to have used to, to rely on on that um, either didn 't change and the you know the bug the bug that we fixed in the header for example hasn 't filtered through for some reason, or um, we find packages that have depended on a header that we didn 't know about and this is also true for static libraries and this is really important for uh, security updates so if we have a security update in a static library and some port uh, depends uses that static library. It really shouldn't, but if it happens that a port does depend on a static library, we can run an X run and determine, oh, this patch, this this port changed when um, a, a, a static library in the base system changed, and we didn't expect that. We should either we either know that we need to release that uh, or update that package uh, in the context of that security issue, or ideally fix the port so that it can link against the shared library instead. Uh, the other thing it allows us to do is, is do a much better job of uh, doing QA on the packages that are built as part of the X run. So if we build the packages and uh, and there's there's di right now we, we build the packages as an, in an X run and we basically get a result that says 99% of the packages built. Um, maybe we run the, the embedded test suites in those, but we really don't know any more than that about how they've changed. And if we start from a reproducible case we can find just those packages 
that are different in the, with the, the, the patch applied and investigate them in, in further detail. So on to the, the, the reason that we want reproducible builds that, that's picking up a lot of interest now. And this is a quote from reproduciblebuilds.org, um, which is a, a website that has, uh, th that captures reproducible builds across a whole bunch of different operating systems and collects documentation and information um, into one centralized place. And so this is sort of the mission statement of reproducible builds. And what we're saying is that we've got some source code on the top that we can verify. And we've got a binary object that the uh, computer is going to use. And we have this process in the middle that we don't really have a lot of visibility into. Um, and if, we, if this is reproducible, then we have a trusted path from the source code to that binary. So that if we audit the source code or if we, um, we, we have some reason to trust the source code and we know that it's, uh, we're, we're comfortable with, with that source and we know that we, we trust our compiler, uh, then the binary that we produce, if we can reproduce it, we know that it's, uh, we, can, we can have trust in that, that binary. And why do we care about trusting our, our tool chain? Well, there's some examples here. Um, this was a, a, some a malware version of Xcode that it was a Trojan version of Xcode that would introduce malware into all the output that it produced. Um, and I think this, this happened in China, I think, because um, there were copies of Xcode floating around. I guess it's difficult to, um, it can be, you know, take a long time to download um, across a, a slow link. And so there might be a local Trojan mirror or something that people were using. Um, this is from a talk um, at 31C3 uh, where the, there was a or an explanation that developer machines may well be targeted. Um, there's, there's a strong incentive to introduce malware or, um, or, or some sort of Trojan onto an individual developer's machine. And you know, we've seen the kernel.org, the Linux kernel.org uh, in 2011, I think, um, had some sort of an intrusion. There was an uh, intrusion into FreeBSD's infrastructure um, and a couple of um, uh, less critical machines in 2012. Um, there certainly is incentive for, um, for folks to try and attack um, the infrastructure of, of open source projects. And then there's uh, a very, um, very interesting paper that uh, if, you haven't, if you haven't seen this before, I, I would definitely recommend um, reading it through. It's, it's, it's a, a really interesting tale. Uh, there's an argument that uh, this is not really a practical attack, and that may or may not be true. Um, but it, it is a highlight of the importance of trusting your tool chain. And there's a, a technique called uh, diverse double compilation that addresses this, um, this, this particular attack. And the whole point is that uh, we need to have reproducible builds as that key to join the source code and the binary. So reproducible builds, uh, it's an idea that's been around for quite a while, as Colin mentioned. Um, it was important in the context of FreeBSD update in the base system. That's probably where the, the genesis in the base system came from. And that was, um, I think, Colin, maybe 2005 or so is, is when, OK. Uh, early, mid-2000s, uh, it's, it's been something that, that's been of interest to the FreeBSD base system. Um, and in ports, there's been some, some uh, um, some efforts on reproducible builds as well. Uh, but what, what's happened recently is the, a couple of folks in, in the Debian project um, have been working on it as well and got some funding to, uh, to really put some structure and a more comprehensive project behind reproducible builds. And so, you know, um, so the Debian, Debian uh, developers, um, uh, Holger and uh, Lunar, uh, have, have put a lot of effort into this over uh, over time recently, and a whole bunch of other projects um, are getting involved. Uh, Baptiste and I went to a re the first uh, Reproducible Builds World Summit in Athens last year, and I think there were 40 people or so there from a variety of projects. So there's, there's a number here, Coreboot, uh, <coughs> Fedora, OpenWRT, NetBSD, um, we're all represented there, and a whole bunch of um, other projects have uh, some of these projects are fully reproducible. Some of these projects have work ongoing, um, and we're all represented at this this reproducible world summit.
So there's, there's four main aspects of a reproducible build. A deterministic build system uh, basically means that we only get the changes in the output that we expect. Um, reproducible build environment is we need some way for someone else to be able to make that same build environment so that they can try and build our same software. Um, distributing the build environment is the actual mechanism and process by which we can give that build environment to that end, end user or, or developer who's going to reproduce it. And then some sort of comprehensive approach for re actually rebuilding packages to say, yes, it does get, I do get the same output when I build it, um, both for providing that, that assurance that it, the, the assurance that it is the right output and to be able to test the reproducible build itself so that we know that package is reproducible or that package isn't. So a deterministic build system means that things don't change unexpectedly. So you want to make sure that inputs into your compilation process um, are, in, are as you expect them and outputs from that process are as, as you expect them. And I'll explain that a little bit later in, in detail, exactly some of the sources of, um, of non-reproducibility in those, those cases. Um, and then also, don't suck in anything from the environment, um, from the build environment, that you don't intentionally intend to. So some examples of, um, of sources of non-reproducibility. Uh, build information, so a lot of tools want to have a version and so you run foo dash dash version, and it says built by user Joe on some date, um, or the uh, uh, timestamp, or um, some sort of identifier from the, the source that isn't uh, unique to isn't a, a unique and um, reproducible uh, attribute of that source. File system ordering: if you have a wildcard make rule, say, or uh, passing a set of uh, directory to tar, the order of the files in that uh, tar or the files in your, um, your static library, for example, will de depend on the specific file system in use. Um, or uh, if you're sorting things, it'll depend on the locale. Archive metadata, uh, .a static archives, uh, static libraries, are just a basic archive format that includes a timestamp. And so by default on a lot of systems, if you just create a static library, it, it'll have timestamps in there that depend on your build date. Um, intentional randomness. There's actually, uh, GCC actually and, and Clang actually makes use of, uh, in, intentionally makes use of random, uh, makes use of randomness in its build process. And so this is for things like LTO, when it needs to generate a unique suffix for symbols, um, it's intentionally non-reproducible. And there's some ways to address that, but um, it's, it's another source of, of non-reproducibility. Also, uh, file system image creation tools sometimes may introduce uh, intentional randomness, U UUIDs, for example. Um, dwarf debug info and paths in general in obviously introduce non-reproducibility. This is a fairly difficult one to address because uh, it's just sort of so pervasive, um, and there's no clean way to to um, to reduce or to strip out the part of a path that um, that's the non-reproducible um, part. Yes. Yeah. So 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 relying on relative paths. Um, uh, across the build system is, is, uh, is one way to address it. Um, I think it can be often be quite difficult, uh, depending on sp the specific build system and, and, uh, and whatnot. Um, optimization is an interesting one. Uh, a lot of builds will detect the CPU type that they're, um, they're running on and then compile the software differently depending on uh, if, if you've got a, a higher or lower end, end processor. So if it's, if it's compiling on an Atom versus compiling on uh, a high-end build farm, it may choose to, to build differently uh, and, and then thus be non-reproducible. And then value initialization. If you've got tools as part, that are built as part of your build process, so for example, if your build builds a file system creation tool, and it has bugs in it that um, cause random, uh, random data from the stack to be output to a, a generated file. That's another source. 
And then for investigating non-reproducibility, what we want to do is introduce intentional variations in a variety of, um, of environmental aspects and see if, if, they, lead, if they feed into the, um, into the resulting build. And so uh, host name and domain name, uh, some environment variables, the user, and timestamps are sort of common ones that, that folks would think of off the top uh, of your head. But the year, uh, year or date I've listed separately from the timestamp just because a lot of times, the timestamp you might think is, is going to be in an archive or, or um, in all kinds of other uh, uh, places like that. But a lot of builds will actually use the date um, or just the day of, of you know, the month and day, say. Um, and if you build it tomorrow or you build it next year, the, the non-reproducibility actually shows up then. And a, a number of different things that we want to intentionally vary to, to investigate if the build is reproducible or not. Um, in, the, in the current investigation on FreeBSD, we're not, um, we're not investigating a lot of these more um, esoteric changes. We're focusing on the more, uh, the, the simplest ones initially. Um, and well, I'll explain why that, that's actually not um, a real problem in a little bit. But as we progress down this idea of reproducible builds, and it, as I hope it sort of becomes just a standard approach that lots of upstream software starts taking, um, we'll look at these sorts of issues later on. So I've been running um, some investigations on uh, on reproducible FreeBSD, both the, the base the system and ports uh, recently. Uh, I haven't been looking at the doc tree. And in general, I don't think there's a lot of um, issues in, not, not a lot of non-reproducibility issues in the doc tree. Um, but PDF generation, for example, often will include a timestamp. And so there's, there, there, there will be a few um, cases of that, but they're generally fairly easy to, to investigate and fix. So the FreeBSD base system, the kernel, the uh, system libraries, and the um, user land tools, it's, it's, we're in a pretty good state. Um, it's all in under our control. We can do whatever we want with it. We can change the build environment. We can change the tools. We can, we can do what we like. And so um, as Colin said, it's been something that we've been thinking about in the FreeBSD project since 2003 or so. Um, there's a wiki page that started tracking remaining issues that, that showed up in 2013. Um, and we're pretty close. So you know, here's some examples of, of uh, non-reproducibility issues that have been fixed in recent time. And like I said, it's, it's a lot of those simple ones near the top. It's dates and time stamps and, and users. Colin? So for, for, the, for the benefit of the recording, um, Colin said that one of the earliest issues he fixed in the base system was man pages that included the date that they were built on. Um, and one man page actually was different only on Wednesdays because the length um, of the date string changed. Um, and actually, uh, dates in man pages is something that's still in the ports list later on. Um, it's not, on, it's not on my list here because it's been fixed long before, um, before the wiki page started uh, being tracked and, um, and before I started looking in depth at the, the issues. So here's some examples of things that are still left to be fixed in the FreeBSD base system. Uh, so we have this mergemaster.m tree file that's generated in the build um, to facilitate uh, updating files in Etsy. And it has this comment block in it that includes well, helpfully, it includes lots of, uh, it, it's sort of a, um, a sample of lots of sources of non-reproducibility. So we've got the user and the machine. We've got a nice random number in it. We've got a date. And none of it actually matters. So the, the fix for this was just to delete it. And um, that, will, that will be something that will, uh, <clears throat> will have to be done shortly. Um, we also like to stick users and host names and times 
into lots of different tools. Um, so this affects the, um, the loaders and uh, the kernel, and uh, I'll mention in a sec. We also have recently introduced EFI, uh, UEFI bootloader components, and the PE header, the uh, Microsoft PE cough header that's on those includes a timestamp. So there's another source of timestamps in loader components that needs to be addressed. And again, we've got the, um, the specific uh, iteration of the build that you've executed, um, time, user, and uh, host, and a path. Um, and the NetBSD folks have added an option to their newvers.sh, which generates this information for the, the kernel information um, to, if you set the option, it's excluded. Um, and I have a patch in Fabricator right now to do the same thing on, on FreeBSD. And one thing I've, I've done also on, in discussion um, on a suggestion from Warner is we have this uh, build version number here, or the SVN version number. And this is a unique identifier traceable to the source. If you build that SVN revision, you'll get the exact same output again. And if the SVN, uh, if you change the, the source rev, you'll get different output as, as you, you desire. So what I, my patch does now is if, the, if you're building from a clean, uh, unmodified SVN checkout, there's an option to exclude the data by default. Um, and if there's modifications in the tree, then it will put the, the data in. If there's modifications, it's not reproducible anyway, so it doesn't matter. And typically, the objections to removing this information from the FreeBSD kernel um, were around people who are doing development and want to know, is it the kernel I just built or is it the kernel I built three weeks ago that just, just panicked? Um, so I, I think the, um, I think having it default on or off based on whether there's modifications is, is a re reasonable compromise. Uh, for the modifications, I don't know, just the idea. Uh, you can probably just run diff and pipe it through the MD5 or something. Well, so we actually, um, for the modifications, we could run um, diff and pipe it to MD5, but um, we could. I, I think it's, um, I think it's, we don't actually, we don't really care about the specific um, uh, details of the modification necessarily. Um, and the nice thing is that we actually already are running SVN info to collect the version number and whether it's modified or not. So there's actually no additional cost to, um, to having that default toggle. A few other things left to do. Um, a few uh, kernel modules end up with the full path in, it, not in a non-debug section. Uh, right now, for, for the repro reproducibility efforts that we have ongoing, um, we're just going to assume that it, you have to build in the same path. So we're not going to worry about that at the moment. Um, but it is something that will have to get, be looked at later on. And there's a few kernel modules that are different right now for some reason that I don't fully understand. Um, and then, like I mentioned, sometimes uh, file system generation tools might include um, some sort of uh, metadata that's not directly from the source. And so this wasn't a problem when I first looked at reproducible base system, but then um, as tests start showing up and need to generate file system images to test the system, uh, some re non-reproducibility crept in with that. And then finally, make what is is an interesting one. So we switched to the Mandoc tools um, and uh, one of the, Mandoc when it, uh, or make what is rather, when it wants to find man pages that are um, hard links of each other. So, you know, three or four man pages uh, are uh, the, the same file. It only wants to index them once. And it hashes the uh, file system and the, the inode number um, and uses that as a key in its own internal hash. And the, the order of those entries and which of the, the which of the n man pages is arbitrarily chosen as the canonical one and, and is output in the, um, in the index uh, is, is dependent on the, the idle number of, of the source. And so uh, there's, a, there's a patch in ElectroBSD for this, which is a FreeBSD fork. Um, it, I think it's not quite ready to be, it's not a, it's not a, a patch that we could take into FreeBSD um, directly. It's a little bit of a workaround, um, but this is something that is definitely fixable. It's just um, a little bit of effort. And then ports. Uh, so the ports tree is a little bit of a wild west, uh, as Baptiste uh, put it before. Um, it doesn't really enforce anything about the way that the software is built. And so um, Poudrier is the, uh, the build tool that we use for building the official package sets, and which we generally suggest that 
end users use when they want to build their own um, own package sets. And that's the focus of um, the reproducibility effort here. We're going to use Poudrier to keep things reproducible when we want them to be and, in, and inject um, variations to explicitly find, um, uh, to explicitly identify re uh, changes that are, are creeping in that we didn't know about. So the ports, uh, reprodu ports reproducible wills wiki page was created in 2015 um, by Steve Wills and there's a patch um, that took a first attempt of taking the looking at all the disk files which are the source files downloaded by the ports tree to do the build finding the latest one and then setting the timestamp of the files in the staging directory for package building to that timestamp and um, so at that time um, you know a little bit over a uh, bit over a year ago about 64 percent of the 65 percent of the uh, ports tree built reproducible reproducibly built packages and the host name, uh, the time, and the date is what was varied in that investigation. And, and then this uh, second iteration came out of a discussion that Baptiste and I had at, in Athens. Um, what we decided to do was we need some idea of a control timestamp. So we need, we're going to set the metadata in the package itself to some timestamp. And it needs to be, it's, it's somewhat arbitrary, but it should have some meaning. Um, and so what we, we decided to do was when make make some is run, um, which is a command that the a port maintainer runs during the update process. So the port maintainer is updating from 1.1 to 1.2. They fetch the new um, new disk files from upstream, check the cryptographic uh, hashes, uh, make sure that they've got the pristine prop, uh, uh, correct download of that um, that package's uh, the, the, that port's source, and then they run make make some, which regenerates the dist info file, which records those um, checksums or records checksums of the, the dist files. And then um, I've, sub I've committed now a, a portion of Baptiste's original change um, that records the timestamp in the dist info file. And we'll use, we'll use the time that the, um, the port was updated as that control time. And then we set that timestamp. Um, right, right now, the first iteration, I set the timestamp in an environment variable called source date epoch, which package then uses to set its the metadata in the package that it generates. Um, the so the the first part of the change that's recording the the timestamp is committed to the FreeBSD tree already. The source date epoch change um, in the build process is not yet in. It's I've I've used that patch in the investigation that I've done here, but it's not yet um, committed to FreeBSD. And so the results now. Um, We've got, uh, um, we're getting close to 80% reproducible with um, a combination of changes that have gone upstream um, and the uh, upstream in the, the third party packages. So as Debian and um, other folks have been working on reproducible builds and getting their patches accepted, a lot of software upstream just naturally builds reproducibly. And I've, I've just chosen a, a few uh, um, examples of some um, packages here that were non-reproducible -re using the, the highly uh, scientific method of holding page down in the list quite a lot and just see, seeing what, uh, what happened to, I, I happened to, to notice. So um, the interesting thing is that there are some um, uh, build tools in here. So Clang LLVM, uh, GCC is in here somewhere, I think, yeah. Git and Subversion. Uh, so uh, important tools that, um, that you might really want to be reproducible and you really, really might want to, uh, to rely on. And then the next iteration um, sets source date epoch in the, in the build environment. So this is not just passing source date epoch to package, but also in the environment used to build the, the third party software. And I'll explain source date epoch in a little bit more detail um, later on. But uh, suffice it to say right now that it's providing that chosen control timestamp into the, the build environment. And I only rebuilt the packages, I only queued up to build the packages that were not reproducible in the first iteration. Um, so all the packages that were already reproducible, I just left them uh, uh, out of the build. 
And the reason that these, these numbers sum to a bit more um, than the non-reproducible ones from the, the previous list is all of it, their dependencies were rebuilt. So the, the, these numbers are basically all of the packages that were previously non-reproducible and the dependencies needed to build those packages. And so here's, a, here's examples of um, packages that become reproducible with that additional change. And so you know, CMake is an interesting one. And what it means is that that package has some, because source data epoch is the only thing that we needed to make CMake reproducible, it means that CMake itself is including some sort of timestamp and setting it to this control value has made the non-reproducibility go away. So um, we, we can use that to make CMake reproducible in our, our environment, but we can also just try and uh, identify where that timestamp is coming in and see if we really need it and perhaps push a change upstream or a local change that just eliminates the timestamp if it actually doesn't provide value. And GCC actually already supports source date epoch. So the underscore underscore time and underscore underscore date um, macros in, in, source, in, in C source uh, get converted to a string representing the current time and date. GCC will substitute the value in source date epoch into those, uh, those macros already. Um, Clang uh, does not yet, but uh, I have a, a patch to Clang that's waiting in, um, in LLVM's, uh, the LLVM code review tool to introduce source date epoch into Clang as well. And um, we get 514 more packages now uh, reproducible by having Clang introduce source date epoch as well. Um, and uh, the reason that this is actually quite a, uh, a reasonably high number um, is because we're using the, the Clang in the base system to build all of this. So this is actually um, any package that is built using the base systems, system, uh, base systems compiler, um, the 514 uh, of those become reproducible with that change. Yes? Have you found any negative interactions between like makes, dependency, calculation stuff with um, custom temp temps? Um, so I, ha I haven't yet. Um, there is, um, I've seen, uh, the question was, have, have I found any um, uh, dependencies with, with makes dependency calculation, have I found any uh, ter uh, bad interactions um, with setting the timestamps? Um, I haven't identified any yet. Uh, I haven't done extensive testing on these. Really, this is just, um, does this package build reproducibly or not? Um, so if the package reproducibly builds but doesn't work at all, uh, it's, I haven't captured it in here yet. Uh, and so uh, a more comprehensive investigation needs to happen to actually run, run the full set of tests on all these packages. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be running the packages um, on my laptop and, and encouraging people to test out um, packages built using this environment. But uh, you're right, not yet. The, the investigation hasn't gone there yet. Um, I have seen reports of um, issues around makes dependency checking on the archive, uh, on the individual autos in an archive. Um, for FreeBSD, we've had, um, We've had reproducible uh, deterministic output from AR turned on for quite some time. Um, so our base case for the base system AR, user bin AR, is already not including the timestamps. It's just outputting zeros. Um, and so you know, whatever issues might arise from that, they're, they're already there. If, if, make is causing, um, if make is causing objects to be rebuilt and reinserted into dot .a's on a regular basis, we're already doing that. Pavel? So th these results were all, um, the question was, uh, was it the same build machine? Um, if the source path changes, uh, et cetera, will, will these results be reproducible? Um, these results were obtained on the same machine um, using Poudrier. So the host name does actually change in these results. And I found a number of, of cases where um, specifically the host name is showing up as a not reproducible uh, artifact and is something that we'll, we'll want to address. Um, I don't remember if I have an example of it later on or not. Um, but um, by default, uh, right, right now, the expectation is that to reproduce these packages, you would build them in the same path that um, they were used, they were, they were done here. Um, Poudrier builds in a, each um, package in its own jail using a consistent path. So 
that's an example of where we're constraining the input by the build tool. Um, so we, even though we may capture that input in the, um, in the resulting package, um, our build tool is constraining it and it won't cause the package to not be reproducible. What I will want to do later on after we get this, um, this base case done is really investigate further, uh, apply additional sources of var additional variations to the build and see what um, is non-reproducible under those variations. But for the, the, the immediate goal of getting to a reproducible set of official FreeBSD.org packages, um, you can reproduce them using Prudriere on your own machine and it will use the same uh, jail paths by default. And so um, I think from that perspective, it's, it's providing a useful um, comparison. And th th these are just the numbers. So we went from you know, just, uh, just under 80% to about 82% with each iteration of, um, uh, uh, with two iterations of, of applying comprehensive changes to the, the build. Uh, <coughs> I have a, a build running um, uh, currently. The, the first build is completed. The second, uh, second set of builds is running for uh, a change to the AR from GNU bin utils to, to enable um, default, uh, to enable deterministic output from that AR by default as well. Um, and I'll see what those, those results, uh, where, we, where, where we end up. I expect that we're going to see about 85% or so. And so this will be all the other packages that we have that explicitly depend on GNU bin utils. Um, and don't use user bin AR. And then here's just a, a graph of the, of the, the results. So uh, the, we'll, there, there's two greens that are almost the same here. Um, and I, I, I didn't really want to distinguish, um, uh, I didn't want to distinguish the two cases, but uh, I don't want to make them, uh, I don't want to draw attention to the, the two changes, but I don't want to try and hide it either. So basically, the, this, this green and the orange here um, are, represent the packages that were rebuilt in that test run. And then the lighter, uh, slightly lighter green are all the packages that were already reproducible and were not built. But just, it's, so, it's so that we can compare the, the sort of overall top line. All right, so now that we have some sort of infrastructure to uh, execute this, this test run, we want to know what changed. So we build a couple of packages and collect their uh, SHA-256 hash. And then we build again, and we can say, yeah, it's reproducible. Or we can say, huh, it changed. But what's different? So this is where a really nice tool um, written by, um, again, by the, the Debian folk um, comes in. It's called Diffoscope. It started as debbindiff, um, which is basically um, uh, based on the, the name of the Debian package format. Um, and it's in the FreeBSD ports tree. Um, Baptiste and I worked on that a bit um, while we were in, uh, in Athens, and then Kubes, um brought in some, more, some additional um, work in FreeBSD Python ports to get it ready, and it's available um, as SysUtils Diffoscope. And there's actually an online version, so you can upload two, um, two tarballs to it or two ELF uh, files or, or whatnot, and it will show you the, the differences. Uh, I'll give you an example of, of the output it produces, which is actually, I think, it's, a, it's really, really cool. Um, and the idea is that anything that's in uh, so if you have an archive or an L file or, or anything that sort of is a container for other objects, it unpacks those and keeps recursing down until it gets to the, the, uh, the final object at the bottom and tries to convert all the objects to something that's human readable so that you can compare the differences uh, extremely easily. And just for reference, this is a, um, a list of the um, archive formats and uh, archive formats it can, it can uncompress and then uh, formats of binary files that it is able to, to render into some human readable format. And it's a, it's, it's a relatively approachable Python code base. So anyone who um, is familiar with tools for inspecting um, binary objects or uh, tools for dealing with archives, um, it would be really nice to add support for as many different tools as possible. Right now, uh, we 
it supports uh, Debian packages, obviously, because that's where it was written. It doesn't support FreeBSD packages natively. It just they're, they're TXZ files, and so it just unpacks them as a, a tar and compares it. Um, but it doesn't parse the manifest file or anything like that in a more um, human-friendly way. So definitely, we're, we're going to want to add some of that um, capability later on. But it's, I think it's a really good example of um, purpose-built tooling that makes investigating things uh, incredibly uh, convenient and, and um, really allows for investigations to happen at a pace that, that otherwise wouldn't. So here's an example of what, it'll do, what it will do. So here's a, a very basic um, non-reproducible hello world that just happens to include the time and date that it was built. And I, I compiled it twice and then run Diffiscope on the two binaries. And in, if you run it on the console, it gets this, this uh, text mode output. And basically, it's, um, it, it runs a whole bunch of different commands uh, behind the scenes to, to, to render different sections in, or different uh, objects into human readable and then human readable form and then shows just the difference of those specific objects. So for, for example, here it's telling us that we have an RO data section, read-only data, and it's identifying exactly what, um, what changed. So compared to, say, a hex dump of the entire binary, it's much, much more um, readily accessible to see what's going on. And here, it handles archives, as I mentioned. So if we compile our hello world and stick it into a uh, tar file and compress it and compile it again and stick it into an archive and run Diffiscope on it. This is an example of the HTML output mode that it has. So you can um, generate a, a, a nice uh, rendered web page to highlight the differences, and it's a little bit easier to, to examine. And it will also do some nice niceties like uh, expand and contract individual sections um, to make it easier to browse. But so here it's telling us that we've got some metadata. Um, and so you can see when I regenerated this example. But um, it's got some metadata uh, in the tar file itself about the uh, objects that are contained therein, and then the objects that were inside, how they differ. And the, the key point about Diffiscope is it's an excellent debugging and diagnostic tool, but it's not a tool for reporting whether or not the build is reproducible. So the intent isn't you look at the Diffiscope output and say, yeah, it's good or not. Um, uh, either diff or CMP or um, uh, a cryptographic hash is what you want to use to determine if it's reproducible or not. <coughs> um, and Diffiscope is a tool to use to investigate reproducibility and take it to a root cause. Um, so I have a lot of information in here, actually, that is, um, is based on some, uh, some talks that have uh, that Debian folks have given in a few different venues that show examples of non-reproducibility <laughs> and how to address them. And the slides are um, on the BSDCAM website, so um, you can look through these and uh, and see how to tackle individual cases. Um, I'll, I'll pick a couple of um, a couple of specific examples here, but I'm going to skip through them fairly quickly because of the uh, the time that we're at. So just very simple. Um, if we're if we're tarring up uh, a directory, the order of the files in that tar archive are going to depend on uh, the file system or uh, or other sort of aspects like that. So we can either list out the uh, the archive members we want to include. We can sort them, and if we sort them, make sure that we set the locale so that they sort the same way for everyone. Uh, this is the one, I guess, that I'll, I'll mention specifically. Um, the biggest source of non-reproducibility in any of the packages I've looked at are things around version, uh, source version, um, build date, username. Um, it's, it's all understandable why a developer wants to see that information, but it's, it's also um, trivially fixed and uh, and makes the package non-reproducible. So in general, instead of generating some sort of a version number, um, use something about the source code uh, that it uniquely identifies that source code. And in FreeBSD, we're already, um, we're already pretty much there because we use the either Git or SVN or Mercurial for the same source. And it, the exact person, uh, the, the username who built it, the host they built it on, it actually just doesn't matter. And if you do want to reproduce, 
that, uh, that binary, effectively you're just going to have to end up lying anyway and say you're a different user on a different host at a different time. Um, and I think it's better just not to include it at all than to be forced to include um, uh, arbitrary but actually meaningless data. Um, and I think, uh, uh, given the time, uh, oh, actually I'll, I'll discuss source date epoch just briefly um, because this is an important one as well. Uh, so this is a spec that uh, was written by the reproducible builds folk and it's, it's available, it's a document you can get from the reproducible builds website. And the idea is it's an environment variable that takes a, a Unix timestamp and any build tool, so whether it's a PDF writer or a compiler, um, a archiver or a, a, um, a file system image creation tool, if the environment variable is set, it can use the timestamp in that environment variable as the notion of the current time rather than the actual current time. And, and uh, you know, the, the, list, the list here, um, you know, it, it, it kind of keeps on going and going and going. It's, it's getting added to more and more and more tools. I have a patch out to Clang to do it. GCC's had it for a little while now. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's becoming a, a widely implemented uh, standard. And I think I'll, um, uh, how about this? So this is a graph of Debian's um, uh, reproducible builds experience so far. And over on the left we have uh, the x-axis goes from uh, March 11, 2015 through to now. And uh, th this is 20,000 packages. So they're, they're a little bit over, over 20,000 packages now. And green is reproducible, orange is non-reproducible, and the others are failed to build or other unknown, um, uh, no, unknown results. And the interesting thing is, you know, we're, we're, in FreeBSD, we're kind of here with, in, our, in our process. Um, we have got a, a, a really big, um, a, a good result early on, and we have lots of reproducible packages already. Uh, but then there's going to be this long tail um, of fixing uh, one-off uh, one non-reproducible problems. So it's, easy, it's relatively easy to get here because there's systemic issues that we can fix. So whether it's source date epoch or whether it's turning on um, uh, de deterministic mode in AR by default, that gets us here. There's going to be a fairly long process of fixing individual ports, that uh, investigating why they're non-reproducible and fixing them. Uh, fortunately, as this picks up currency upstream uh, across a whole bunch of different upstream projects, um, it'll be easier and easier for downstream consumers like FreeBSD to uh, to increase the, the, the proportion of reproducible packages um, because the, up, the, the uh, stock source from upstream will, will natively or just naturally be, uh, be reproducible. And this is uh, bugs submitted against the reproducible builds project in the Debian, uh, Debian community. Green is closed, orange is open. And one of the interesting things is that all of these bugs or most of these bugs were submitted with, uh, with patches attached. And so I think that's, that's one sort of key aspect is, at least initially, um, just submitting a bug that says your, your package is not reproducible isn't really going um, isn't really going to work. Uh, but if we can submit a patch that says, here's how we can here, here's a, a simple change to make your package reproducible, it's, um, it's going to be much more productive. Okay, um, I'll take a couple of moments for questions. Thank you. How to contribute? <laughs> uh, so, I, I, the question is how, how to contribute, and we're in. Um, I think we're in in fairly early days um, in the FreeBSD reproducible builds effort right now. Um, mo all of the uh, the investigation I've done here was in as a lead up to, to collect the data for this talk. Um, I think the the next step we really need to do is get some continuous integration going so that we are regularly building the entire FreeBSD package set um, to identify the packages that are non-reproducible. And what I'm really hoping is that we can have um, the CI system showing a list of the packages that are not reproducible and, uh, and anyone will be able to go through and find packages that they're interested in and sort out how to make them reproducible. Yeah. Well, well, I told you we're, we're, about, uh, we're building about 300 ports. Uh, mm -hmm. So we can definitely integrate some of the stuff uh, into that and basically need to, uh, we just open uh, ticket program ports, body ports against uh, any non-reproducible 
So I, I don't want to encourage people to start submitting um, uh, PRs without patches just yet. Um, I think PRs with patches uh, against individual ports is, is a great idea. One of the things I'll, I will do, though, is make the lists of all all of the lists of reproducible and non-reproducible packages that I obtained um, out of this investigation, I'll, I'll stick them on um, uh, I'll, uh, somewhere referenced from the FreeBSD um, reproducible, uh, port reproducible build wiki page um, so that anyone can compare the list of um, packages that they're interested in in their own environment with the, the lists there and, and identify which ones might uh, be interesting to tackle. Was there very much representation from the proprietary software uh, houses, whether it be um, operating systems or ISDs who are producing um, commercial software? I asked as an, uh, someone who works at an ISD who's been looking into this problem. Yeah, uh, the question is, was there much representation from proprietary software vendors or ISVs um, at the Reproducible Build Summit in Athens? Um, there, were, there was not. Um, the Athens summit was really, uh, I think it had a, f um, a fairly tightly curated attendee list um, just because it wasn't clear exactly what format it was going to take yet and um, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't clear what um, the way things would go. Uh, I think there's a lot, in, both the, te the techniques and even some of the, um, the results apply very much to proprietary software vendors as well. Um, and I, uh, I think as, uh, as both as more sort of um, uh, training material and presentations on how to make your software become reproducible um, and as reproducible uh, other derivative projects uh, uh, and projects that build on reproducible builds um, start getting some currency in the, the community, um, I think there will be uh, both more interest from um, ISVs and proprietary software vendors, and venues for um, uh, for proprietary software venues to vendors to interact with the rest of the reproducible builds community. Well, to be honest, that was Google. Pardon me. That was Google. Uh, so Google was uh, was represented at the the summit. Um, I mean, they they were sort of also helped to organize it. Um, Google is a bit of a special case because they have a a, a very large uh, open source uh, program as well. Um, so I, I'm aware of the uh, of uh, the question is about um, the Nix package manager and the work that they're doing. I'm I'm aware of them. Um, I'm not uh, really knowledgeable on the details, and I don't have um, uh, I don't really have insight into uh, into it at this point. Well, No, so I, um, I didn't look at the doc repo yet. Um, I, I do intend to, but I also don't think that the, a, any problems in the doc repo um, will be relatively easily solved, I think. So, uh, you know, I, I focused primarily, uh, I, I focused the efforts primarily on ports actually so far, um, just because it's, it's a huge um, uh, corpus of, of uh, software and the cycle time to investigate uh, whether a, a change improves reproducibility is, is so long that um, that's where I've, I've, I've spent my effort uh, so far. But I think over the next um, uh, you know, six months or a year, um, I expect that I'll have looked at, um, or either myself or, or others will have looked at uh, further at source tree and also the doc repo. Well, the doc repo is in the post tree. Uh, Baptiste points out that the doc repo is included in the ports tree, so um, it's implicitly uh, covered as well. Um, I, I also have um, the Diffiscope results. Um, that they're not completely uh, finished yet, but I have a script um, generating the Diffiscope results for each of the non-reproducible packages, and I'll stick that uh, somewhere as well. 
Okay, I think my time is up, and you probably want to get out of here before uh, uh, at some point as well. So thank you very much.